I'm Tom. Hi, everybody. Oh, I love that energy this early in the morning. I want to say welcome back for the semester. It's really great to be working with all of you today. And uh, for those of you for whom it's your first time doing this, welcome. This is an awesome, awesome thing that we're doing here at Utah State University. And could you help me clear up a little mystery? My hosts have me staying over at the University Inn, which is just the next building. And I noticed that on all of the towels and the washcloths, it says Utah State University. It's splendid. But then the mat that you wipe your feet on, that says BYU. <laughs> okay, so some people know what we're talking about here. So as we're, as we're going, a couple of housekeeping things. This is going to be an interactive keynote. And so I might be coming down around. And if you have ideas, questions, comments, please put a hand up and, and we'll have some conversation. But one of the first housekeeping things I'd like to do, um, my wife thinks that I'm actually up running the green trail right now. So let's prove to her that I'm actually at work. Just say hello and wave to Marianne. I'll just take a couple of photographs just to prove that I was here. Thank you very much. Awesome, awesome. All right, cool. What we're talking about today is universal design for learning. I want to make you two promises. One, you will leave here today knowing how to actually get started with UDL in a way that doesn't require you to do a ton of extra work. Promise number one. Promise number two, you're probably going to hear more lame Star Wars jokes in 35 minutes than you've ever heard in your life. Some of you are laughing. You are in good hands. I'm wearing the Stormtrooper socks. So also, if you don't have to call yourself out, but there might be some people here who have never seen any of the Star Wars movies. If that's you, just gently turn to the person next to you who is a giant nerd, and they'll help you out. So to get started, a little audio cue. Just let that wash over you. Wait for it. OK. Who recognizes that? Just about a lot of people. Shout it out. And of course, it's up on the screen because that's good UDL. But why would we start off with the music for the bad guys in the Star Wars series. I hear they're more fun. That is an excellent answer. Not the right one, but an excellent one. So why might we be starting off with this music? Well, I want to ask a quick question. What do you know already about universal design for learning? And this can be anything from I've heard the term before to I'm using it in my classes now, to I'm an expert and get off the stage, pal, all the way through from soup to nuts. What's one thing you know? Just one quick thing that you know about UDL. OK, this gentleman said, you're going to tell us about it. Are you OK with a high five? Yeah. Because awesome answer. And that's the learner's mentality. By the way, I asked him if I could give him a high five. I was doing a keynote like this a couple of years ago, and a lady had an excellent comment, and I just rushed over and I said, high five! And she said, I have pepper spray, so now <laughs> I ask. But what's one thing you know about universal design for learning? One thing. Say that louder. Different modalities. That's an excellent answer. We're gonna actually going to cover that in about six slides, so pay attention for that. What's one thing you know? I heard accessibility, and we're actually going to talk about why that's an excellent answer. And, and I heard somebody over here, too. Anticipation. Could you say more about that, please? Ah. If I'm paraphrasing what my colleague is saying, this is 
a way of thinking about the interactions that we have so that we can anticipate some common situations where students have barriers. Yeah, there was a hand over here. Yeah, underutilized. Underutilized. Ooh, that's why I'm here. That's awesome. Excellent. A couple more. What do you know? What's one thing? By the way, front half of the room, back half of the room is kicking your tail. Come on, front half. <laughs> one thing. Just one. Right here. It accesses different networks in the brain. It accesses different networks in the brain. This gentleman has seen the stuff from CAST, the Center for Applied Special Technology. And he's right. We're actually going to talk about how we don't learn anything unless we activate three different brain networks. And we're actually going to talk about why knowing that is actually one of the reasons why not many people do UDL. One thing. We've got time for one more. Please. Oh, are you okay with a high five? <laughs> Sweet. It's not a one and done kind of a thing. UDL is an iterative practice. We have to go back to it over and over and over again. So let's dive in. You folks have got a really good baseline for universal design for learning. And if you've never heard about it, let me introduce it to you. I have placed information vital to the survival of the rebellion into the memory systems of the SAR-2 unit. On the screen, you see Princess Leia, played by Carrie Fisher. Rest her, we lost her last year. And those of you who know the Star Wars movies, it's 1977, and she is putting what suspiciously looks like a compact disc, which won't be invented for another two years, into one of the robots. It's the plans for the super weapon that the bad guys are developing, and by some happenstance, the robots get into an escape pod and they crash land on the right planet and then they get sold to the right people and then they get taken to the right person for whom that message was intended. In George Lucas's cinematic universe, what do we call that series of amazing coincidences, that thing that pushes events toward a common destiny? What's that called? Yeah, somebody said, the force, duh, right? I, I call it bad script writing, but I'm a fan. Here's something that you can take back to all of your institutional locations. We've got folks from around the state, not just here at Logan. One of the challenges is that for everybody who's not here, all your colleagues, I want you to go back and be secret, sneaky, evangelists for universal design for learning. And one of the things that gets in people's way is that when we say UDL, our colleagues can make a mental mistake. And they can think about the student who comes to them with a piece of paper that says, I need time and a half on my test. That's an accommodation. That's making one change, one time, for one person. And that's a lot of work. That's a lot of fuss. And I want to suggest that instead of talking about people with disabilities, learners with those kinds of barriers, now, I have to be careful when I say this because I am an advocate for people with disabilities. But I found that we get a lot more traction from our colleagues when we're not talking specifically about folks with barriers, but we talk generally about the barriers in everybody's study. If you had to guess, what percentage of students at Utah State University own a smartphone? I hear 98. I hear 98. Can I get a better number over here? <laughs> yeah, people often guess north of 95%. And if we can reach out to our students on their mobile devices, and that's what I'm talking about with Princess Leia, she put information that she needed to get out to Obi-Wan Kenobi, the wise old sage, she put it into a droid and sent it out into the universe, trusting that it would get where it needs to go. Fortunately, Motorola has created a phone called the droid, so the, we can put our information here too. Here at Utah State, you folks have led the country in distance telecommunication with interactive IBC video and place-based 
distance education. What I'd like to suggest is that universal design for learning allows us to take the interactions that students have with the materials, with each other, with us as the instructors, and with the wider world, and allows them to take that interaction into their own hands because the barrier that we need to overcome these days is not distance anymore. Distance education, distance means nothing. Our barrier is time. So if we can give students 20 more minutes for studying, for interacting in their busy days, then that can be the difference between struggling and keeping up. So, What's one way, if you want to keep your brain in Star Wars, what's one way that Leia, if she had technology like we have today, and Obi-Wan had a cell phone, by the way, that means the plot of Star Wars, it would be like a five-minute movie. <laughs> but if Obi-Wan had a cell phone, what's one way that Leia could reach out to him? Or if you don't want to play along with the Star Wars metaphor, what is one way that we can reach out to our students and give them more choices about how they interact with us, with each other, with the materials in our courses. What's one thing? If you haven't put a hand up, now's your time. I'll come back to you. Video. Video. Yeah, so pre-recorded lectures or even face-to-face um, -face online. Pre -rec yeah, pre-recorded video or having face-to-face -face office hours for your remote students, splendid. I saw a couple other hands over here and then back here. Or maybe I didn't. Let's just go over here, please. And then we'll go to the back. Online website with interactive. OK, so making your website or your learning management system environment more interactive. We'll talk about what interactive actually means in a couple of seconds, so good foreshadowing here. There was a comment in the back, and we'll come down front. I am at Thomas J. Tobin on Twitter, and I just got an awesome comment about Twitter at the hashtag U-S-U-E-T-E -E conference send. Yeah, using Twitter for class purposes. And if you haven't seen my friend Alec Kouros, C-O-U-R-O-S, he's Kouros A on Twitter, he uses Twitter for his educational technology graduate students, and he has them interacting in a lot of different ways. There's a comment down here, and I've got one right here, too. What's one way? No, I didn't hear Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and switch. <laughs> There's one down here, too, please. Podcasts and Facebook. Okay, so podcasts, Facebook, using different kinds of social media. There's a lot of different ways that we can connect with our students in places where they already are. I also don't want to suggest that we have to go where the students are. Making the students come to us is okay. Doing so in a way that gives them choices is what we're all about. It's true. All of it. I love that clip. What you heard was Han Solo, the real hero of the Star Wars movies, um, telling the new heroes... Ray and Finn, that he thought the Force was a bunch of hokum until he saw it happening. So what you see up on the screen is Han telling those new heroes what the Force is really all about. Let me tell you a little tiny story from the neuroscientists at CAST, C-A-S-T, that's the Center for Applied Special Technology in Boston. These are the scientists who, in the early 1990s, figured out that as learners, whether we are six years old or 60, we don't actually commit anything to long-term memory without engaging three different brain networks. And we'll go back to the comment we had right off the bat. And so what they figured out is to engage those brain networks, we need to engage people with multiple ways of being engaged. Sorry, I'm an English professor. I just said multiple ways of engaging people to engage. Let's try that again. We need to create multiple ways for people to feel engaged with the topic. This is the why of learning. 
You've probably experienced it in your own classes over and over again. The assignments where people really catch fire and take off, they're the ones where they can connect it to the rest of their studies or the rest of their personal lives. The ones where they see an, a direct application. And the ones where you say, well, this is just an exercise you have to do to demonstrate the competency, they dutifully do it, but they don't really catch fire with it. And so having multiple ways of keeping people engaged. By the way, this can be as easy as telling people when you ask them to read something in a journal in your field, up at the top, Gesundheit, up at the top, give them an estimate of how much time it's going to take to read that. If you're thinking about your learners who are putting the kids to bed at night, or they're at the laundromat and they've only got 40 minutes while things dry, if you put that time estimate, they can say, oh, I have 40 minutes, and the estimate on this is, is 30 minutes. I can read that. By the way, how do you make those estimates? Read it yourself and then add 50%. If it, I'm serious. If it takes you 10 minutes, tell people it will take them 15. It's not meant to be a science. It's meant to be a kindness that allows them to choose when and how they interact. Also from UDL, we want the what of learning. This is what people think about when they think about accessibility. They think about putting captions on videos. We tend to think about making transcripts of our audio podcasts. And this is true. Multiple ways of representing information so that students don't have to put the hand up and say, hey, treat me differently. I need this in Braille. I need this uh, in a different format. And when we offer people the choice, even people who don't identify as having disabilities will take the choice based on their circumstances. Say that you have somebody who is a military deployed learner and they're on field exercises and they only have a really poor 3G connection on their phone. Well, if there's a text-only transcript of that beautiful video that you created, then they can still study. But if all you give them is the video, well, I've got to just wing it or wait until it's the last second. Also, multiple ways of demonstrating their skills, multiple action choices you see on the screen. This means for all of those areas where you can give people a choice in how they demonstrate their skill, how do they demonstrate your, uh, we've got a flight instructor in the back, so how can they go through a simulation? Can they work on paper? Can they show a process first before they actually sit in a cockpit? Um, my nurses in the house, before you actually start doing venipuncture, can you actually ask your students to choose whether they want to diagram out venipuncture techniques or work on a, a, a pig cadaver as a model? But give them those choices, and they're going to actually take advantage of those choices. Here's the cool thing about offering students choice. It increases what our president and our provost are on all about. It increases student persistence. More of your students will be there at the end of the course to take the final exam. Student retention. More students will come back next term to take courses with us and complete their educations. And it increases student satisfaction. More students feel like their professors care about what they're doing and are supportive of them. Now, remember I said I want you to be secret sneaky evangelists? Don't tell anyone else this knowledge. This is a secret just among us and the people watching the recording at home. What I'd like to say, up in the top right corner, don't tell your colleagues all this neuroscience and brain science stuff. Their eyes will glaze over and they'll say, yeah, that's great. Tell them that universal design for learning, at least to start, is just plus one thinking. Here's what I mean. If there is a way for an interaction to happen in your class, students interacting with the materials, with each other, with the professor, with the wider world, if there is a way for an interaction to happen in your class, plus one, just give one more way for that interaction to happen. 
See, if you already are a bleeding edge person and you've recorded 82 two minute videos to introduce concepts, and then somebody comes to you and says, yeah, and you know, the law says we have to have those captioned by yesterday. You'll look at that and you'll just go, that's so much work. And you will suffer from analysis paralysis and you won't even start. So when I say plus one thinking, this helps us to keep the scope of what we're doing within manageable boundaries. I want to help you to do good universal design in your courses in a way that doesn't require a lot of work. And what you hear is the sound of Darth Vader's TIE fighter, the bad guy's spaceship, bearing down on you. What you see on the screen is a couple of young men, uh, one of whom won the costume contest at Walt Disney World. He uh, gets around with mobility in a wheelchair, and his parents made him up like Darth Vader, the bad guy, and put the pieces of Darth Vader's ship on, and then the parents dressed up like the Imperial Guards. They won the whole contest. The other kid on the screen is Ryan Anderson from Colorado. He and his dad spent a bunch of time in their wood shop making a snow speeder, the vehicle of choice when you're defending a frozen world, and uh, he went around and got about 800 pounds of Halloween candy. <laughs> Come on, kid who's using a wheelchair shows up in a Star Wars costume? Here, just take the whole thing. And he sold it and raised money for charity. So these are the stories that actually get in the way of all of our colleagues adopting universal design for learning. Because these are those feel-good stories about people who have disability challenges. And universal design for learning is about so much more than just reaching out to a small segment of our student population. It's about reaching out to everybody in the time they have to give them more options, give them more choices. So when your faculty colleagues come to you and they say, well, yeah, that's just for those people over there, you can say, no, it's for everybody. And here's how you say it. I tend now not to say the word accessibility in my initial conversations with colleagues. I talk about access. Chop the end of the word right off, and I talk about just access. We have been all about access for decades, right? When, when Utah State University first adopted the IBC distance video stuff, it was a revolution in reaching out to our communities. There's a social justice aspect of it. And so is universal design for learning. It is a way to make it so that fewer people have to put a hand up and say, treat me differently or do something special for me. Now, you may be wondering, well, this sounds like a lot of work. Can I talk frankly about that? It's a lot of work. <laughs> but there is a way to narrow it down so that you only do a little bit at a time. And that's what we can do here. I was talking with Sam Johnston. She's one of those neuroscientists at CAST a couple of years ago. And she said something that makes me break a keynoter's rule. I'm actually going to read something off the screen. <laughs> she said, we want a situation that is good for everybody. Part of it is thinking about what has to happen at the level of design that makes accommodation less necessary. And if you take away nothing else from this keynote, know that accommodations, that's making one change one time for one person. And that is horribly resource intensive. It's a lot of work. You often don't see it coming. And it can bring up negative emotions among your faculty colleagues. Like, I'm a little mad. I didn't, I thought I had all my prep work done and now here this one student, I've got to spend all this time and effort to help this student. Now, give ourselves credit. We don't say that to the students, but it can come into our minds. And so when we talk about design, this is work that pays you back. Let's talk about five strategies for implementing universal design for learning right now, right away in your courses. Five, and I see a couple people going five, so the slide is working. <laughs> five. 
Strategy number one, start with text. Um, we got a couple of seconds. Let's do a, a real quick stretching exercise. We're about halfway through our, our keynote. So just put your hands out in front of you like this, palms forward, and then just push so that you feel your palms moving forward away from you. Just push. You'll feel the tension underneath your arms like this. Splendid. Now let one of them drop, but keep the tension on the other one. You'll feel that shoulder push forward naturally. You are actually stretching out all of the typing muscles in your arm. This is an awesome thing to do at your desk when you're writing or you're grading. Then keeping the tension, just bring it back across and put it on your shoulder. You'll feel the tension shift to the outside and your shoulder. And then just raise it up gently and put it back down. This is the micro release of the muscles. This is also giving yourself a pat on the back because you are already doing this. That is really an exercise. I, I made a joke, but it really is a good exercise. You do it with the other hand, too. If you have lecture notes, if you have materials that you're creating for your videos, start with a script. I know there are people like me who would prefer just to wing it and then I'll write it up later, but make sure you have that text piece. Because then any time that you make a two-minute introduction or you make a... Uh, a quick video or a podcast to go with some of your text-based material, you already have your plus one. So strategy one, start with text. Strategy two, make some alternatives. On your screen, you see a chemistry professor in her lab. She's on her computer. And on her computer, we have the PDF of a journal article that she wrote in a prestigious academic journal. There's two students in there interviewing her. One of the students has a thumbs up. Also, good UDL is describe what's on your screen. One of the students has a thumbs up because he knows we can take that PDF and post it in a way that if you can select the words in the PDF with your mouse, then people with a screen reader or other access devices can have it read out to them. And that's not just for people with visual disabilities. It's for me when I'm on the bus going home and I have my headphones in and I want one of the reader apps, which you can get on Google Play Store or the iTunes Store for free to read it out to me. And so I don't actually have to read on my tiny screen. I can listen. The other student has a video camera, and he also knows that making alternatives is an easy thing. The video that he's taking of this chemistry professor, there's a still camera down behind his video camera because if we take some still images, five or six of them, out of that video, and we put them into a Microsoft Word document with some notes to the side, that creates a really good study guide, and that reduces the cognitive load for students. It also allows them to study better, and your colleagues, when you get back to your, your locations here in Utah, they might say, well, this sounds like it's dumbing things down for the students. Not even close. Keep your academic rigor. Make sure that you are making the process simpler, but not the content itself. So keep that level of detail. Strategy one was start with text. Strategy two, make some alternatives. Strategy three, let them do it their way. This is the one that I think is the most powerful, and we don't do this often enough. So up on the screen, you see the traditional three-page paper, but you also see a few five-minute audio podcasts, and you see a student who has taken the selfie camera on her phone and did something useful with it. Hi, I'm a student in Dr. Tobin's class, and I'm going to talk about this microeconomic concept as though I'm a TV reporter. If we have the same objectives throughout all the choices we're giving here, we can grade that audio file, that video file, and the three-page written paper in the same way. And this also allows us, no matter what subject we teach, whether we're talking about history, we're talking about practical arts, we're talking about welding, we can grade that in the same way, and it reduces construct irrelevance. That's a psychological and neuropsych term, meaning what are we actually grading? Now, I'm an English professor, so how can my students demonstrate APA format and one-inch margins in a video? They can't. So that's the asterisk for this particular strategy. If your assignment is the format, don't give students a choice. 
UDL is a framework for what you do. It's not a set of prescriptive directions. So if the, the format is the assignment, then don't give them choice. But you know I give my students choice when they're drafting. Even though everybody has to produce a Microsoft Word document at the end of the process, I'm okay with them drafting paragraphs out loud. I'm okay with them writing it down and giving them the choice. So strategy one, start with text. Strategy two, make some alternatives. Strategy three, let them do it their way. Four is go step by step. How many of you folks learned to drive a car from a friend or a family member? Oh, awesome, a lot of you. You are excused from this next thought exercise. Also, please, you all get on the road before I do tonight. The rest of you, I'm going to imagine, took driver's ed in school or from a formal driver's ed company, yeah? Where did they tell you to put your hands on the steering wheel for maximum control of the car? Ooh, 10 and 2, just about everybody. So if you imagine that the steering wheel is the face of a clock, for those of you under 18, a clock is a round thing with two sticks on it that helps you tell time. <laughs> you put your hands at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock up toward the top, right? They don't tell our 15 and 16-year-olds this in driver ed anymore. What do they tell them? Nine and, Nine and three, yeah, like on the sides. Do you know why? Airbags. airbags is correct. By the way, public safety announcement, if you have your hands at 10 and 2 and the airbag deploys, It'll cross your wrists and you'll break both of your wrists just a split second before they hit your head and you'll give yourself a concussion. If you're at nine and three and the airbag deploys, it pushes your hands away from your body. Possibly you get a little bruise on your shoulders. So public safety announcement, thank you very much. <laughs> Why am I talking about driver's ed? Because 10 and two is not a dead concept. 10 and two is an awesome mental way to think about how to chunk things up, the interactions that we have with our students. If you give information for 10 minutes, stop and ask your students to do something for two minutes. Don't cheat on the ratio either. For every 10 minutes of you giving, ask them to do for 10 minutes. We've actually been doing it in this keynote. And you can see up on the screen, here's a suggestion. Watch a video and read a case study, but then post a response to the case study in the learning management system in our discussion area. By the way, neuro secret number four, it doesn't matter what the action is. The act of taking the pause allows processes in our brains to start moving things into long-term memory. So even if your two-minute thing is go to the fridge and get a snack, your students will remember the stuff you gave them much better. Strategy one was start with text. Strategy two, was make some alternatives. What was three? Ooh, you guys are paying attention. Let them do it their way. Four is go step by step. And five, set content free. I mean this in two different ways. There's that clock again. And set things free from the clock. If you have a way for students to interact, again, with the materials, with each other, with instructors, or the wider world, make sure they can get at that interaction when they are on their own time. There's a big study in learning management systems done recently, and they said, what are the times when students are most active in the online portions of our courses, the learning management system, whether we're talking about technology enhanced face-to-face -face, all the way up to fully online? What are the hours of the day when they're most active? I hear eight o'clock, no. Oh, I heard it right here. So it's 11 o'clock in the morning until about 1.30 in the afternoon, the lunchtime, local time. And then it's 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Our students have jobs, families, military service. They're taking care of older parents. They have all kinds of demands on their time. Most of our students are burning the midnight oil. So if we can set our interactions free and give them choices for when and how they study, how they interact, we're going to give them an advantage globally for all students. Also set content free from format requirements. If I put up a Microsoft Excel file that shows a solution to a business problem, 
then my students have to have Microsoft Excel on the devices that they're using in order to see that example. Now, a lot of cell phones these days come with Microsoft Office, but also lots of us use software that you can't get a phone version for. So the thing to do, use a screencasting software and talk through your example and then post that video up on YouTube or to your media sharing service here at the university and point students to that. All they need is a video player and then they can actually go through those examples that you're giving with the device that they happen to have with them. So those are the five strategies. And I want to wrap up with a real quick story. No more dragon you require. Already know you that which you need. Now that you have Yoda's blessing, Yoda, the wise old counselor from Star Wars, now that you have become secret, sneaky evangelists for UDL, listen to Yoda, we should. I'd like to hear your takeaways. What is one thing that we've either underlined that you're already doing, or one thing that you want to explore more. If you have a question, a comment, what's your one thing? Let's wrap it up on a strong note. Right here, sir. So uh, having a pause after 10 minutes, doing that 10 and 2, whether you're in the face-to-face -face classroom or you're creating interactions online. And am I aware of studies that negate that? That's, that oh, indicates. Oh, that indicate, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yes, and you can go to cast.org, C-A-S-T dot O-R-G. That is their website. And there is one tab there called Research. They have data from 30 years back all the way up to today to support that 10 and 2 model. They won't call it 10 and 2. I'm simplifying a lot here but you'll find that there. What's one thing you're taking away? One thing. I love this idea of the estimated time to read for our different um, assignments that we make them read because I think that's just a great accessible tool. So an, an accessibility tool is giving people time estimates. That counts toward what we call executive function. It helps people with their time management. It helps them understand how they can fit their study into their days. Awesome. What's one thing? giving students choices in how they engage in their learning. You will have students thank you for this. When they have a choice about how they do the path through the engagements you have with them, they're going to be more satisfied with their educational experience. They're likely to be more successful. You're likely to get better student ratings at the end of the term. Excellent. Please. If I'm paraphrasing, the comment was, I have students from a certain ethnic population who sometimes struggle with putting their thoughts on paper, but they can tell stories really well. And so if I can give them an alternative that helps move them into telling stories on paper, that's all to the good. Am I paraphrasing well? Excellent. What's one thing? We've got a couple more minutes here. One thing. Alternate formats for turning in an assignment. By the way, get creative with this and don't do it all at once. Um, just choose one assignment where you know you could grade alternative formats. And don't give them, don't tell your students, hey, you can submit whatever you want. Oh, professor, what does whatever I want mean? <laughs> give them plus one. Just the written thing and maybe one more thing. And give them some structure around it. Excellent. What's one thing? Wait, so give your students the rubric that you're going to grade them on and say, show me this. Yep. Are you okay with a high five? Because this is what our education departments have been training K-12 teachers to do 
for years and years and years. It works just as well with our undergraduate and our graduate students. Give your students models. Can you expand on that a little bit? Can I expand on that a little bit? Okay, so if I, if I give you a, an assignment and I would like for you to have a clear thesis statement, give me five details and support it with at least four uh, unique sources of, of information. Each of those outcomes, each of those objectives is something that I'll put into a grading rubric. So for the thesis statement, I want it to be clear. And then I say, what does a poor one look like, an emerging one look like, an average one look like, a good one look like, and an expert level one look like? You earn your points based on where you fall on that continuum. And the same for each of the other objectives. And then give those grading criteria to the students before they do the assignment so they know what you want. Someone will say to you, that's dumbing it down. I say, heck no, that's removing cognitive dissonance. One thing, we got time for a couple more here. It doesn't have to happen overnight. If I could give hugs out, I'd give out hugs, but you're okay with a high five? Yes, this is a process that doesn't have to happen tomorrow. Please don't tell the US Department of Education I said that, because there are laws about accessibility for public facing content. No one is doing it perfectly right now. So actually taking a first step is the thing to do. So excellent comment. And I think we might be at that time, and indeed we are, where I have to leap up on stage and say something inspiring and make sure that this is working. There we go. Awesome. So. I'm going to be over, I'm going to be giving a, a quick workshop. If you want to dive deeper on this, it's in ECC 046 at 1030. And then I'll be out there with all of your colleagues who have awesome things to share with you throughout the rest of the day. Thank you so much for making this interactive. I felt very welcomed. You guys go out and be evangelists for UDL. Thank you very much.